Isn't it awesome to worship Jesus? I love it. It's fun. What's the best day of the week? That's right, amen. <laughs> uh, be opening up to Ephesians chapter, uh, where are we at? What am I preaching? Four? Um, and we're in this series called Learning to Walk. And, uh, and by the way, there's outlines in your programs. Grab up, a, jump up and grab an outline. And if you're kind of jumping in here in the series, most welcome. And one of the things you need to understand if it's your first morning here or online is that uh, Paul, this is Paul's most eloquent and I think beautiful letter to his churches. Um, it's probably the last one he wrote to the church. And, and, uh, and it's a letter that was circulated around other groups like ourselves meeting in the region, in the area. But what is so key is that you understand your position in Christ as being crazy blessed. And that's not, the crazy is not in the Bible. <laughs> that's my word. And there's also a uh, sheet out there any Sunday morning, and it's attached on to the PDF that's uh, now available or will be quickly on the online. And it's just called Crazy Blessed, and it's a devotional. And I encourage you to grab this and pray it in your life. Don't just know these things. Pray these things into your being, because God's knowledge, God's truth transforms us. And... Uh, I have found it very helpful uh, at times when, you ever have a, light, a week where things are tough, it just feels a little beyond you, anyone? Anyone? <laughs> and, uh, and it just helps me know how blessed I am in the Trinity. And we find this in Ephesians 1, that the, and it's one long verse, though most translations break it up for our sake and this. Uh, paragraphs and sentences, but verse 3 through 14 in chapter 1 is one long Greek sentence and blessing, and there's, and there's the blessing of the Father and the blessing of the Son and the blessing of the Spirit, and, and on the back is a devotional that you can use for yourself, and so not just once, let your life, I want you to be men and women blessed Blessed, blessed, crazy blessed. And that's what Paul's doing. He's positioning us, seating us in the heavenlies in Christ so that from that place, once we're positioned in Christ, we practice Christ in the world. And you can't flip those around. If you're trying to get blessed by practicing good Christianity, good luck with that. You're already blessed, so walk in it, and then your practice will get so much better. And we're entering into the last three chapters, so half is about our position. The second half is about how we practice Christ in the world, in all our relationships, and with your kids and kids, with the parents, with we practice in our, in our workplaces, whether you're the employer or the employer, you know, we practice with a neighbor, we practice, practice Christ in the world. So do you remember, church, what those crazy blessings were? Read it, chapter 1. Pray it until it just starts flowing without even needing the half sheet, but just to help us practice. And it was great when we, I said, what are the blessings of the Father and, and what are the blessings of Son and Spirit? You'd call them out. But it's so quick and easy to forget them. So I am intentionally opening with this prayer of blessing upon us because it is important in today's passage, every passage, but it's important uh, to where we're headed this morning. So here's going to be my opening prayer, just praying this over us. And, it, and so be thinking, do I know what, the, can I remember what the blessings of the Father is? Do I know the blessings of the Son, the Spirit? Well, hopefully this will help. So bow your heads.
Father, you inspired these blessings of you and the Son and the Holy Spirit into Paul for the church. And so, Lord, let us take into our thoughts and into our heart these blessings. And you have blessed us, Father, by choosing us. You chose us to be holy and blameless before you, before the creation of all things. We didn't We don't make ourselves holy and blameless and perfect. You chose us to be that and through your Son make these things possible. That we can stand in confidence before you in the name of Jesus Christ. And have a relationship and worship in in the holiness that Jesus has bought for us by the cross. Thank you for the blessing of being a adopted as sons and daughters. And Lord, you didn't have to. This was your good pleasure and your good purpose to create sons and daughters in the kingdom, those that you embrace in your love. And you have a purpose and a calling for us as sons and daughters. We're not in our identity servants. And help us take on those identity as your children. And thank you for the blessing of grace in the, your beloved Son that we get to live a life of grace. Thank you for that blessing and let it permeate our lives. And we thank you, Jesus, for as the Son, the blessings you give us that you redeem us. You redeem us out of slavery, Lord, because without you, we're slaves to our sin in this crooked and twisted world. And we pray that you redeem us out of, a, out of that and forgive us for those sins and that you will also then free us for the sonship that the Father is giving us through you. And Lord, we, Jesus, we also praise you for the wisdom and insight because there's a, the Father has a will for us, our lives and help us learn personally the intricacies and the things that you want us to do as sons and daughters. And lastly, Jesus, we praise you for the blessings of reconciliation and restoration. For we come to God, sometimes with brokenness and woundedness and lies that have stuck to our minds. And I pray you restore us to the original image that you meant us to live from. And we praise you, Holy Spirit, that you... Seal us. You seal the Father's presence in us. We never have to doubt that. You seal us with ownership, for we all need to feel like we belong. You seal us with the promises of the Scriptures. And they are ours, and they cannot be taken or stolen away. You guarantee the Lord's love that we have in this moment and the inheritance that will come when Jesus returns. And so we have that hope and the joy that you have guaranteed over our lives. And lastly, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you empower us to live lives that are more than conquerors, lives that can do the impossible if it wasn't for you, Holy Spirit. And so let empower us to live lives for the praise of God every day of our life. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, come on. I want to get charismatic here, but this is good stuff that God's given us in the Scriptures. just want to stop there and ask the worship team to come up again. But there's more that God wants to speak to us, so... Hopefully that gave you time to swipe over to Ephesians 4. And uh, and just to say, as testimony, this isn't just a Craig thing. I love uh, that Karen took this half sheet. Karen and Sarah and and Rachel and women in the church are part of this uh, shelter from the storm. It's a ministry to single moms and their children. It's a a refuge, a place for them to live and find. and, And anyway, they've invited a new cross and to come in and do devotionals. And when it was Karen's turn, she took that. Right? Am I correct? Sarah did. Okay. Okay. Well, one of you guys, use something with the sheet with the women and, and just talk to in the Bible study. 
Bible study. Okay. And, uh, and just what a blessing it was to them. So. so this morning, uh, we're looking, the sermon's titled, Building Up the Body of Christ. We're looking at verses 7 through 12. And we've just began, Jerry just began this last week of what it means now not to just be positioned and sitting with God. We need to do that first before we walk. And, and this idea of walking, though, it wasn't uh, drawn out. In a fee, and eight times that word walk comes up in Ephesians, and that's why we're making it the focus of the sermon series. And, and in chapter 2, verse 1, don't turn there, but uh, verse 2 talks about, Paul says, in which you once walked following the ways of the world, the course, and Satan, and, you know, captive, captured by sin. And so there's a way we used to walk. But then in verse 10, one of my favorite verses, Paul says, For we are his workmanship, poeme, beautiful workmanship of God, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so, (laughs) just this morning, just the way my brain works, but I was thinking in verse 1, to, yeah, we used to walk in the ways of the world, and I thought of Steve Martin walk like an Egyptian, you know. And, uh, and you know, isn't, but the truth is, didn't God had to redeem his people out of slavery in Egypt, and that's what he's doing now with us. So we don't walk like Egyptians, we walk like sons and daughters of God. And in Ephesians, Paul is, this whole series is titled Learning to Walk because this is what God wants us to do. And so, now, chapter 4, verse 1, just to read this one verse of this, where we now encounter that idea of walking, and it's getting specific. Paul says, and Jerry preached a wonderful message on this last week. He said, there, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So we're not trying to be worthy of God. We're trying to be worthy of this great calling he talked about that we have upon us. And do you catch an urging? He's excited. It's like a parent or a grandparent that's so excited when, when the, the baby goes from crawling into wanting to walk. And, and we, I introduced this whole series with this idea of for Jill and I, how fun it was to see our granddaughter Perone almost wanting to walk. She could crawl like crazy. She just had that. She just was refusing to walk. And I and I even showed you how she was doing the bear. And I'm not going to repeat that. She outside because she didn't like how it feels on her knees to to crawl. So she was just refusing to walk. And you go, come on, come on, you can do it. And so when we started this series about three months ago, and she had just recent, you know, not long before that, had learned to walk or walk. Well, I want you to know she's progressing. She's doing great. And so the kids are with us this weekend. And, uh, and yes, this is just an excuse to show you another photo of my beautiful granddaughter, Perone. And so she is really learning to walk, and she's got her bright yellow rubber rain boots on, and she, in her underwear, in her diapers, and she is walking and running around the house. This is what excites me, and I encourage it. And this is what Paul's trying to say to the church. Come on, put your bright yellow rain boots on, and let's do some walking. But I want you guys to be dressed. <laughs> and so it's just fun. And you, and you see the joy on the child's face as they learn to walk. And that's how it is with The Father in heaven, he looks at you going, come on, this is going to be so awesome. You know, it's time to not just be sitting, but there's a time to be walking. Now, in chapter 4, and I'm not going to reread these, but over and over, the word one comes up. And, you know, and it's, you know, and, and Paul's just helping us understand now. He's, he's like, it's not just you. You are one in the body of Christ. You're one in the Spirit. You're one in the Lord. You're one in faith. You're one in, in God. You're one in the 
Father in heaven. And, and so we have this identity as a community called church. And, and so you guys ever heard that phrase, uh, kindred spirit? That's what I was thinking of. That's kind of what the church is. There, it's men and women, young and old, all kinds of people, all kind of different ethnic groups. And we're one in a kindred spirit. Because, you know, and, and kindred just means a group of people who share a, a nature alike with one another. And it's like, wait a second, that's what Paul's talking about as we're one. And so because we're born in the same spirit, we're, we're kindred in this connection with him. And we're kindred because we have the same origin, because we've been reborn in the spirit and in Christ. And so we're kin. And Paul talks about that in uh, chapter 3 where we're family. And he gives these metaphors of the church. He's trying to help us have this, this one community, group identity. So we're, he talks about how we're citizens of God's kingdom, and he's the king. We're family. We're all members of this, uh, of, of this family. And, uh, and then he'll talk about how we're all, we're all part of the living stones building up the temple. And so I talked through that, those metaphors. But he's going to be using a different kind of metaphor this morning to describe walking, and it's the metaphor of a body. Christ is the head, and we're the body. And so, from a position of being crazy blessed, and this is the big idea this morning, from a position of being crazy blessed by God, we can work to build up the body of Christ in His truth and in His love. Did you catch the work? So it's not passive. We have things to do to build up this body. And so the three big ideas, just to put them out there this morning, the three points, you got the big idea. And this you'll find in your uh, um, outline. But which I put where? Where did I put that? Ah, all right. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> now I know. Now I got something to say. Uh, so each one of us is receiving the first point: grace and gifts for good works. We are growing into the fullness of Christ. We are working in truth and love to build up the body. So. Let's read the passage, and then we'll jump into the first point. Verses 7 through 16. Just bow your heads one more prayer. We, we know, Holy Spirit, that we need you to even understand and discern spiritual things according to what Paul said to the church in Corinth. And so we ask you now to open up our understanding, get deepen our insight, in a way that we can't do without you. I pray for all, all those seated here, that you pour yourself into them as we read these words in, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, speaking of Jesus, he led a host of captives, and, gave, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower, lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the good works of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of knowledge of the Son of God 
to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I love that. To the measure of the stature to the fullness of Christ. That's what we're wanting. 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Ooh. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. These verses and it's and uh these verses are continuing this idea of one. And Jerry established our identity as a community, a people, a church. We are one. But in understanding, and, and in America, we have such an individualistic identity. It's, we have to understand it's not just us. We belong to the body of Christ. But we do not get lost in this ocean of oneness. We are part of an ecosystem. It's like in this ocean of oneness, an ocean is a living thing. It's not just H2O with some salt. The ocean is, is more of a combination of than the water molecules because there's living aquatic ecosystem where things are going on from the smallest plankton, tiny plankton that you could hardly see to the largest mammals on this planet called whales. And, and they all are needed for this ecosystem to function well, right? Are you plankton or a whale? It's not in my notes, but I think the Spirit wants you to ask yourself that. No, but you're necessary. And and a matter of fact, you know, for the geeks like uh, Dustin on the computer, you know, even Apple has an ecosystem. Do you know that? Look it up. You can find ap Apple as an, an, it's not even my illustration. It says Apple's ecosystem depends on the integration of hardware and software. See? You lose, if the hardware doesn't work, what good's the software? The software is funky, the hardware stinks, you know? And, and, so you, and so the church is an ecosystem of men and women who are, are making up different parts of the body. Now, this oneness, I want you to capture this. It's just, this is the Greek part of Craig, the Greeky geek. Um. In verse 7, let's put verse 7 and, uh, and verse 12 up. 7 says, but the grace was given to each one of us. So what you need to understand in that, and uh, Dustin, we have the slide of uh, 7 and 12 with the uh, thanks. Um, get out of the way. So now Paul is saying in this oneness that we have in God, in his spirit and faith, he now says, but I want to talk to you, church, about each one of you. Okay? Each one of you. And, what, and why this whole passage belongs together, and you can now be looking in your Bibles in verse 16, where it says, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with, in which it is equipped, when each part is working, or, you, or you'll have different translations of this, and none of them put the Greek word one in there. It's there, and it, and it doesn't change the meaning. It's, it's, it's still when each part is working, but it's actually literally each one part. So the word one's missing, and I just want to point that out because each one of you in the whole one matter so much to the Lord. 
and are so critical in the church ecosystem. Amen? All right. Let me get the lights on. Thanks, Scott. So now, as we saw in uh, Ephesians 2.10, there's work to do. What kind of work? Good work. Yeah, it's not bad work. Bad work's what we do without God. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's this good work to do. And I kind of had just this, this revelation like, whoa, this passage, it helps when we understand how it all began. Back to Genesis. You'll hear me many times say, Genesis is replaying itself, but hopefully getting redeemed for what we lost in the garden. And so in Genesis, God created everything. But what he did, you read in Genesis 2, and we'll just read uh, Genesis 2.15. On the sixth day, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to... Work it and take care of it. And this work, so work is not a curse. So I had to start there. This took place before the fall. Work is blessed. Work is holy. It is a good thing. It's not a punishment for sin. Now, it, it too, work got messed up and hard because when Adam and Eve uh, decided to take over, um, it did not go well. But what I want you to see is there's this idea at the beginning of the Bible, there was this beautiful place where God's with Adam and Eve, and there's this good work of maintaining and making the garden wonderful, right? Tracking? Now, the fall comes. They get kicked out of the garden, but God didn't give up on humanity but now he wants to redeem his relationship with us. And so now what happens in terms of big, well, there's so many big stories, but there's the garden. Now we find ourselves God rescuing the Israelites from Egypt, Egyptian slavery. And he wants to be with them like he was with Adam and Eve in the garden. And so he instructs Moses on the mountain on how to build the what tabernacle. And then in the tabernacle was the place that God's presence would come and live among his people. But there, but there was, if, if Moses walked down with the blueprints and there was no people, there would be no tabernacle because God needed people to work together to build this. So what I'm, wanting, what I'm wanting you to understand is work is holy and it's also spiritual. So what does God do? In Exodus chapter 31, verses 3 through 4, we read, God calls Bezalel and says, I, he's speaking to Moses, I have filled him, Bezalel, with the Spirit of God. And he's going to do really spiritual stuff, lead worship and preach messages and heal people, right? No, listen to this. I have filled him with the Spirit of God with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for what? Work. Work in gold, silver, and bronze. So when I pause, this is where you help me preach and shout out what you know I want you to say because it helps all of us. See, we need to work together. This is not a show. This is us learning God's Word, right? So I encourage that. And, and so do you see that, and by the way, it goes on to talk about how God's going to fill him. So it's like guys here, you know, and, and gals that love wood, and it's like he worked in wood and metals. Do you know what else he worked in, which I'd never paid attention to? Embroidery. So I like that too. We once did a quilting class, and uh, one of the guys 
took some blood stain, blood, blood from a bear that got on his jeans to make a quilt he, he was going to give to his daughter. And we all work in different materials. But then in Exodus 36, 2, then it says, Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Holiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. The temple was made possible by the people who God given them skills to build that. And I, what's interesting about this is it said who was willing. I wonder if sometimes Christians are like that. I'll show up at the temple on Sabbath, but don't ask me to do anything. It's like God's going around looking. I'm looking for a willing heart, man. Is there a willing heart in the house? Raise your hands, right? That was rhetorical, so good. You didn't raise your hands because I don't want anyone embarrassed. So, the good works that God's given us to do, He created for us according to 2.10, even before you were born. And so you, do you know, you weren't just created to be in His image, you were created for good works. And the question is, are we willing, do we have the heart, the desire to do them, right? And, and so, I love how God gives me opportunity or illustrations. I don't have to work very hard at these. It's more of like, well, you know, there's too many. And so I'm here, yeah, and I want to just emphasize this because I think I'm making a point here about God spiritually gifting us because there are some things you do, you go, eh, but it's, I'm just good at that. It's not spiritual. Or you look at what some of us to do that, that pray and teach God's Word and and worship, and, uh, and maybe we have some spiritual gifts that we can prophesy. And you go, that's spiritual, but man, all I can do is swing a hammer. So, ironically, I'm in my office all day yesterday from morning to dinner time. And I'm doing spiritual work. I'm reading, I'm writing things for this message. And do you know what's happening on the other side of this wall, literally? There's Aaron, and he's one of the elders in our church, and he is banging and drilling, and, and, uh, and he is lifting up these cabinets, and he's building, while I'm building a sermon, he's building a kitchen. And Aaron, you know, like um, Bezalel, God's gifted spiritually with the craftsmanship of his hands. I'm working in paper. He's working in lumber. But it's all got the same source, right? And so it's, uh, and so it's just really fun, I think, when God sees us using all these different gifts. So never look down on whatever it is you do. Maybe you got a great smile. Not all of us do. And maybe you just actually greet people and make them feel welcome with your beautiful smile. But they're all, all these things are gifts, right? Amen? So, um, what we read in this now, and by the way, just as we walk through this, in verse 8, Paul is quoting from Psalm 68, and he's talking about how Jesus... Oh, by the way, but grace was given to each one, verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us. So this grace is not just the saving grace. This also grace is empowering. And so it's, you know, it's like 2 Corinthians 12, 9, for Jesus saying to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. So never feel like your weakness is an obstacle. So as grace comes into us to build a... Um, be an important part of the body of Christ. And then it says he ascended on high, and, uh, but he also descended, meaning Jesus came from heaven. His existence, he, he has always existed because he's part of the Godhead. But he came to earth and he conquered God's enemy, 
his, this, all our, we all have the same enemy. It's Satan and his, and his demonic force who wants to destroy, kill, destroy us, right, and steal from us. And, and Jesus defeated that enemy. And Paul, normally when the king brings the captives into the city, then, they, then he receives gifts from, the king receives the gift from the conquered foe. But Paul, Paul puts a little shift on it and says, and he gave gifts to men. And then he elaborates on this in verse 9 and 10. And so he gives you gifts. He is giving you spiritual gifts. That he says in verse 10, that he might fill all things. And so with these gifts, you and I get filled up with Christ. The world gets a little more full with Christ as we use those gifts in the world too and not just in the church. And so we see that we have good work to do. But then it goes on to talk about apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Sometimes this one verse can become uh, overemphasized um, and, and build all kinds of things around it. And, it's, and there's a, I'm just letting you know there's a lot of ways of reading and understanding this idea that there are, Jesus has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers to do what, though? to equip, in verse 12, the saints. So they certainly have gifts in those roles, but I, I think more than this identifying the gifts, it's identifying the people, the men and the women in the, the church that use their gifts to equip the rest of us to not only understand our gifts, but how to use them. And so they're almost more like offices within the church. And some would say there's three um, because apostles and prophets are really speaking to the same thing and also shepherds and teachers are the same. But it doesn't matter. I don't want to get hung up on is it three or five because we miss the point. And so apostles just means those who are sent by Christ to speak and act with authority for the benefit of equipping the church. And Paul was an apostle. There were 12 apostles that had personal encounters with Christ that had special gifting and authority to grow, start and grow the church and write some of the New Testament scriptures we have. And those 12 apostles are gone, and we will never have apostles in those positions where they're writing scriptures like we did at this time. And so those, that, that type of apostleship has ended. But there is a second apostleship because Paul himself talks about and identifies the names of other apostles. And so at New Crossing, you can... You can have your own understanding and what you think. Do the apostles and the prophets, have they all ceased and there is no more? But at New Crossing, we believe, um, the elders believe that God continues to call apostles and prophets for the purpose of equipping the church. So there, but I am saying, Paul is likely speaking about the apostles and the prophets that had come up to this point because we read about them earlier, but that does not mean that those, those offices and giftings have ceased to exist, understand? And prophets are those simply who God uses to speak on his behalf, not, not the prophets that were prophesying for God in the New Testament, the end times, and how all these things, the scriptures that, were, that we now have, along with what the apostles wrote, but we still have men and women. And Paul, 
he, oh, let's just read it. First uh, Corinthians 14, chapter 1, and he begins in uh, uh, chapter 14, but I just want to say from verse 1, he says, pursue love, which is the big idea of what it means to belong to the church. And so love is a key word of our passage this morning, and in Corinthians, he says, pursue that. And he talks about earnestly desiring the gifts, the spiritual gifts, but he says especially prophecy. And here's why in verse uh, 3. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their what? Upbuilding. And that's a word that we've heard as we read this morning's passage more than once. There's this idea of building up, upbuilding and encouragement, and in consolation. So, it's not new scriptures God speaks, for those of you wondering. So, are we saying God's speaking new, new scriptures through the prophets? No. But they have this role where they're listening, and they can speak words that will build you up, words that will encourage you in those times that you deeply need it, words that will console you when you're suffering and, and you know so that who doesn't want that and so I want God to raise up more prophets in the church we you know and and amen it's like I have been so blessed personally by those of you sometimes you it's like you know I just felt you know I get a text or an email or a phone call I felt like the Lord was wanting to say this and it's it's just so encouraging to us when those gifts are used I was, I was, uh, give you a a specific example. I was with a group of pastors, um, and uh, this gentleman was, uh, Ben was teaching, and and then he he prayed for us. And when he prayed for me, he actually spoke about you, the church. And he said, I just see a community on a mission, a community that there's not just providing a place of peace, but to get people healed up and to equip them. We just read that in our passage this morning. And equip them so that they can go and do damage against the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. Yeah. With me, right? Yeah. Do damage against darkness. It's so needed as God's light in the world. And then there's evangelists who proclaim the truth of the gospel story, you know, the gospel story of Jesus, and we're, uh, and, we're, and we're helping people get out of those slavery, the evangelists. By the way, it's not just gift, the people gifted with evangelists. All these things, prophecy, evangelism, teaching, shepherding, all of us have, in different times and moments in our lives, will use our gifts, even if we don't have, you know, what I'm calling the gifting or office for that. We're all speaking words of encouragement and consoling. We're all sharing the gospel. It's not just for a couple people and we go, no, I don't have to be the light in the world. You know, Joe and Susie, they're the light, you know, of the church. No. We reflect the light of Christ when when those opportunities come. Then we have shepherds, which you could understand that as pastors. It could also be translated pastors, but in the New Testament sense, that's what a pastor, they're a shepherd. And we have men and women that shepherd, you know, each other, because a shepherd is someone who cares for and protects. But the church has elders. Elders are shepherds. And we have Scott and Rick and Aaron, who I already mentioned. And and it's so cool to see these guys shepherding the church. And, you know, I'm among them too. So I'm one of the shepherds. And, uh, and, 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 you know, so it's like Aaron's building a kitchen. Rick this week led the men's uh, knowing the Reason for God Life group, uh, Rick and, and Aaron will be up here to pray for you after the service. You know, you're, you have wonderful shepherds. You really do. And I know that in the women's ministry, they, they shepherd the women. You know, Sarah and her team, they, they take the women. Every wo- woman in the church has one of the women leaders who prays for them, stays in contact. And the men do too through the elders. 
And then there's teachers. And so shepherds care, but the teachers are faithfully passing on and explaining the teachings of Christ in a way and helping you understand how to apply the scriptures to your life. This is what our membership, which Scott's going to be leading the membership class after the service, and that's what the membership class is for. It's not just, hey, here's our church. It's like, let us help you know your story. Let us help you understand your identity. Let us help you understand the gospel. Let, and, and part of it is discovering the gifts that God's given you. So let me just kind of take this idea of the first point, receiving grace and gifts. And, and by the way, in the membership class too, we tell the people going through that, whether they're just checking out the church or they're becoming members, doesn't matter. At New Crossing, there is no failure to try and use the gift you have to bless the church. The only failure at New Crossing is to not try. And so if you try something out and it's like, yeah, that didn't feel right, that's okay. You didn't fail, you tried. You're on a road to discovering your gifts and using them because we need you. We need each other. So let me ask you, connecting the gifts with the grace I mentioned, which is the power, what are you? Are you a shovel? You know, are you a dingo? What? (laughs) Um, We're we're having, Jill and I are having uh, Aaron's, uh, the company he... uh, helps ser- work and serve and manage in. And, and they're building us. Uh, they're put, we have some rotting sliding doors. Uh, we need doors replaced. We're having a deck built. And it's been really fun for me to watch because it's not one guy with a shovel. They had to remove all the footings of our old rotting deck and put in new ones. So they had to not just, re- could you imagine even two guys trying to move those footings? But the guy had a dingo with a, an auger, or I don't know, it's drill bit. I'm not sure what it's called um, on the end of it. And it drills these holes. And so you could sit there with your little shovel trying to, I don't know how many, I didn't count them. There's like 10 or 12 of these holes going down four feet deep. Or you got this. And so sometimes Christ, the point of this is Christians try to do the work without the power of God. But you need to know Christ lives in you, and by His Spirit, you got a lot of power to do what would be impossible without God. And we work as a team. He's got one team, one, you know, one team that digs the holes and puts in the new footings. He's got the framers. He's got the guys that do the doors and the trims. And everybody has their skill set. But I also love talking with uh, Jeff, how he used to be on the cleanup crew, Now he's the expert installing these beautiful sliding doors. And so they learn from each other. They grow. And it's just that's what it means to be the body of Christ. Right? Sound good? Does that sound like good news? Yeah. All right. Get the lights back on. Um, So growing in the fullness of Christ, our second point. Here's a question. What keeps us as individuals focused and not going off on our own, building our own little kingdoms, doing our own little things, which happens too often, people going in different directions but also creating divisions? What keeps us from doing that? Let's read verse 10 and then verse 13 through 14 in Ephesians. By the way, Paul will speak to something and then he'll come back to it because he's thinking like a Hebrew. He's thinking concentrically. He'll talk on something, come back to something, talk on something, come back to something. And as opposed to, um, help me out here, linear, but that's not the word I was looking for, um, sequentially. Um, But linear also works as Greek thinkers, which we are in America. So sometimes when you're reading the scriptures, it's like, wait, was he just talking about building and growing up? Yeah, but he deepens our understanding as we go along. So verse 10 reads, and he who 
descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And then verse 13 and 14. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the what? Fullness of Christ. So he's wanting to fill us for the purpose that we become the full image of Christ. And so what keeps us from staying individuals and and, uh, going off and doing our own thing is a unified goal that we are trying to build up one another until we all are experiencing Christ in us, living through us, working through us, in us, loving us, working through us. That's the fullness of Christ. And so I like how James Montgomery Boyce said, he, he said, because what's happening here is, is we are growing in unity of faith and knowledge. And this faith is, the, is more than just the essentials of the gospel of what it means to be saved, but it is, a, it is our believing in that the scriptures are true in what they're teaching us about the Father, Son, and Spirit. And it's our faith in the morals of God that are timeless, that, are out, that go on for millenniums and is outside of every culture and ethnic group. And, and these are the, this is what our faith is anchored to. But the knowledge, the unity of knowledge, this knowledge is not just a knowing with our head, but it's a knowledge that we experience because Jesus is the truth. And so James Montgomery Boyce says, knowledge that goes beyond what can be packed into the head, knowledge that also trickles down into the heart and flows out into the life in obedient and loving service to the Lord. I love that. Want to know what it's like to be like Christ? Read the Gospels. You see the character of Him. Do you want to know what His attitude's like? Read Galatians 5, through 23, and you read about, and they're all anchored to love. Out of this love, there's joy and peace, and, you know, and then there's just all these beautiful characteristics. This is what it means to have the fullness of Christ. And Paul is saying it's so important that we mature, that we don't stay immature like a child. Now, are children wrong for being immature? They're born that way. You're born in the Holy Spirit. But let's not be men and women spiritually immature like a child, which he says are tossed around by the waves. You know, they, they, they get deceived and de- and believing things of the world that mess them up and that causes them to misbehave. It could be funny, but tragic. You know, like children that when we don't like something, we throw tantrums. You ever seen that? Child, very well practiced, throws themselves on the ground on the floor of the supermarket because they can't get their 99 cent chocolate donuts. And Jill says, Craig, it's time to grow up, get off the floor, right? We shouldn't be like that. We need to grow up. (laughs) Just got the eyebrow. Um, Point three. Working in truth and love to build up the body. And so here we read, just the second half of 12. See, here's going to be this concentric for building up the body of Christ. Then we read in verse 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love. Actually, let's put those up there. Oh, yeah, great. 15. So we speak the truth in love. We are to grow up. There it is again in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body of Christ joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part 
is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So love in this comes up twice because it to because this is the materials we work in. We don't, you know, we're not working in the soils. We're not working in the gold like the garden and the temple. We're working in love. And so we speak the truth in love. To, you know what harms the church is when we just proclaim our truths. When we're just speaking the stuff we want people to know. And we do it without love. And, and we do it for the, for the wrong purposes. We're doing it to impress people or just make people agree with us. And when there's no love in it, it just, who, you ever talk to somebody and they're, maybe what they're proclaiming is truth and doctrine or, or understanding of things, but you don't receive it, do you? Because it's like it's coming from a heart. There, there's no love behind those words. And so love helps us know how much to say, when to say it, what to say, for the purpose of what? Building them up. So is the truth you speak in the lives of others to build them up? Or is it self-serving words to just get what you want or, or build yourself up, I guess, using that? So ask yourself, are you using your words for the wrong purpose? What, ask yourself, what is the purpose I'm saying what I'm saying? Am I, am I strengthening this person who needs to be loved and hear the truth because they're coming out of a world of lies? So, Jesus, I love, and I'll close with this illustration, and then we'll pray. I want, I want Christ to be your, uh, uh, I want to show you this. Um, I really know I'm supposed to share this, and I want to skip this. Um, in John chapter 9, as we look at this idea of working, speaking words, doing work for the building up and loving of people. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, in verse 1, it says, as, he, as Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. So I love that he's looking for opportunities to build up. He's intentionally wanting to live a life that builds up, and we should too. So look. Look. Just, that's the first point. Look. And then in verses 3 and 4, and he has his 12 disciples with him. And they're wondering, Rabbi, you know, is he blind because his parents sinned? Or did he actually sin and then God struck him blind kind of thing? And, and Jesus answered, and I want to put this up here. Let me read it from here. Because our translations, all our translations um, tend to put the reason of his blindness so that God might work God's uh, might works might be displayed in him so the purposes of his God has them blind so God can demonstrate his greatness and God can do that if God wants to do that he did that with Pharaoh he hardened Pharaoh's heart more so that his this new group of people called the Israelites would follow him would see how mighty he is in overcoming the greatest of all enemies but here, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. Punctuation is difficult sometimes to know where to put the commas in the period. And our translation, the ESV this morning, puts a comma. The others have different ways of doing it. And, and so there's a comma, this man not sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed. But I believe it needs to be a period with a new sentence, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And now, instead of a period, it's a comma. We must work the works for him, of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. 
So there's this idea that it's not just Jesus left and made you, give you work to do, but we encounter people that need to be healed, need to hear the truth, need to be built up, and God has work for us that He's created, and He's working with us. We're not on our own, and we must work the works of God while we have the opportunity. Amen? But here, here is something very cool, and this is what I close with. I was thinking, how did this guy end up as we're talking about being, you know, gifted, you know, and I wonder, I wonder if, and I was thinking, did he, have, did he, any of his gifts, now that he's had an encounter with Christ, get revealed? In verse 29, we read about, so he gets called into uh, the uh, council and the, and the religious leaders, and, and they say to him, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. So, so they're speaking to this man born blind who now sees, and they're wanting to know, how does this happen? How is this possible? And they don't like it because they know that Jesus is attached to this miracle. But listen, and you tell me what this man's gift is, how God's going to use him in the, in the future church. Here's a man that's been blind, never been to school, a beggar, a nobody. And he's about to school the educated. The man answered, why? This is an amazing, because they remember, they asked, you know, how and why this happened. Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet, he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin and, would, and you would teach us? And they cast him out of church. What was his gift? Huh? Teacher. He's been given a gift to teach, an apologist to defend the faith. This guy that should, you would say it, that would be impossible. So I invite the worship team to come up. Bow your heads and ask yourself, what is the spiritual gifts the Lord has given me? Ask yourself, where in your life do you want and need to grow in the fullness of Christ? How can you help build up your church in truth and love? So, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because you're all working in these verses this morning, help each of these beloved ones. Know how you've made them in your image. You didn't just save them by grace, but you're empowering them by grace to live in the fullness of Christ. I pray, help them and me grow up. I don't want to be done. I want to mature more in Christ and your spirit. I want to mature in truth and faith, deepen their truth and faith. But especially this week, let them ask you, what is the spiritual gift or gifts you've given them and how might they use that in your body, Jesus? You are the head. You're the source and the authority of this church. We need you. And in your sovereignty, you choose to need us to be a blessing to one another and to this world. Let your love permeate in our words and truth. Let your love work through us. Let us work in the material of divine love as we love others to the praise of 
God in heaven. Amen.